Antonio. Hello, everyone. Hi. I've met many of you before, and uh, hopefully the rest of you later on. But for those who don't know, my name is Alan Cathcart, and I'm a VMCC member since 1974, when I had one of the finest motorcycles I ever owned, the Scott. 1934 Scott Flying Squirrel. I wish I still had it. I foolishly sold it to buy Vincent, but I'm better now. <laughs> the, um, but the subject of my talk is something I'm an expert in, myself. I know that many of you have asked me to talk about myself and what I do for a living and how it came about. And I'm one of those extremely fortunate people who managed to make his hobby, motorcycles, his livelihood. Uh, I started doing that a long time ago. And uh, in preparation for, uh, for today, I was sent this by a friend in America about growing old. Now, old is, uh, is, a, is a, a relative term. I feel in the, in the time of life right now, as many of you out there, I think, are in, are, are, are in the same position. But here's what Jim said me. I have everything that I wanted as a teenager, only 60 years later. I don't have to go to school or work. I get an allowance every month. I have my own pad. He's American. I don't have a curfew. I have a driver's license and my own car. And I'm allowed to ride motorcycles. Life is great. People I hang around with are not scared of getting pregnant and I don't have that. <laughs> of course, I do talk to myself. Sometimes I need expert advice. So, Here's my uh, expert to say, uh, resume of my career as a, as a journalist. Uh, first of all, I should say that uh, unfortunately the Queen hasn't yet invited me to kneel in front of her and be crossed with a sword on my shoulders, and I'm not really Sir Alan Cathcart, but I'm called Sir Al because in the late 1980s I started working for Superbike magazine in Britain. <coughs> And the editor of that was Grant Leonard. And Grant uh, was uh, determined to, to uh, separate me from the rest of the Hoyt Roy in his editorial office um, by denoting the fact that I have a received accent and a little bit of a, uh, an educational um, background. I was a law graduate from Cambridge University and uh, therefore I should be denoted as Sir Al from then on. And it just sort of stuck. And that's why so many people continue to call me Sir Al. I'm still waiting for the telegram to the Queen now. Um, other things that, that people have asked me about is my helmet. Uh, now you can see what I look like underneath it. Now that's why I don't get photographed unless I can possibly help it without the helmet on. But the helmet has a Union Jack, a large one, fluttering in the breeze. How did that come about? Well, I had an Allied contract uh, ever since the, the late 1990s, uh, sorry, 1980s. And in 1990, John Kaczynski won the 250cc World Championship for a Yamaha with, with a showing helmet with the stars and strikes fluttering down the side and an American Eagle over the top. And um, I thought, well, I already had a Union Jack on my helmet, but it was quite a small one, small uh, jack, Union Jack on a, on a black helmet. So I suggested to Mr. Arai that he might like to do me a helmet with the Union Jack fluttering down the, the side, and he thought it was a great idea and sent it along. And I must say, it looked rather nice. Photographed very well in magazine articles too. Uh, but he put a lion over the top, and the lion didn't photograph very well, it looked a bit muddy. So, next time, next year, I asked him, unfortunately, get a new helmet, and I helmet every year. Next year's helmet had a, uh, had the Union Jack on its own. That's how the, this was the official trademark of Alan Cathcart as a journalist came about. Um, my life in motorcycling is, is has been completely backwards in every way. I started out racing cars before I, I raced motorcycles. I started out with vintage bikes before I graduated eventually to a superbike. And um, I did have a, uh, a very, the first bike I actually restored was a 1952 Motor Guzzi Gambolungino, 
which Arthur Wheeler had uh, raced and which he had got a, a Reynolds frame made for it by the late, great Ken Grayson, who sadly passed away last month. So I took that to Vintage Mallory in 1974 or 5, I can't remember when it was. And that was when I started to meet people in the Vintage Club. And I realized what a wonderful group of people it is, was then, from so many different interests, modern bikes as well as old ones, and from all different walks of life. Uh, it was strictly a hobby then, but I had gradually started racing at the club level, and then I found a, uh, a motorcycle that I was able to start winning races with, which was a Matchless G50. In those days, it was a single cylinder class at uh, MC, uh, uh, Newmarket, mostly in the southwest of England, some southeast of England. Uh, and actually Southwest too, because the North Gloucestershire Club used to uh, organise events at a lot of the Iron Circuit places. Uh, Cola, Gordon, Lovington, Wells, all places like that. Anyway, my G50 was a, uh, uh, a, a beloved member of the family. Certainly it's the last bike that I've ever actually sell. I know that my son has uh, great eyes for it. So, I started to, to work my way up the results. I then got a Ducati 750 SS on the first green train production races. And that was a wonderful bike to ride on the road while I originally bought it, but then to go racing with as well. Uh, in due course, I started racing at Mackey's, and I think that's what a lot, a lot of people know me for, particularly in the 1970s. Races in the Isle of Man. Uh, Fourthly, got a fifth place in the in the Formula Three TT, and fourth in the World and the Historic TT. And then moved up to the Formula One Kawasaki BMW, and I, I had actually started uh, getting further up the results with that. I crashed it in the Isle of Man, at the place where somebody else was had been killed, so I got away with that one. But uh, that coincided with starting the Classic Racing Motorcycle Club, which my wife and I, my Stella, and a couple of friends uh, founded in 1979. So I picked two years off from racing to do that, to the Kawasaki, and when I started again, it was with a, uh, a different lot of motorcycles, and uh, I had by then started to work with the Germans. How did that happen? Well, Classic Bike Magazine was founded in 1978 and the first issue came out and it had a story about the factory BSA Triumph Tribbles including where are they now? Well, they missed mine out because I had actually discovered one in Houston, Texas and brought it back to Britain Ron Chandler has it today and uh, I wrote it into the editor to say do you think uh, you, you should, uh, great magazine by the way, but uh, you might like to know about my trouble if you missed out. Now in those days, a chap called Willie Green, who used to have a garage very close to here, just outside Derby. Willie Green used to write the fantastic race of tests for classic, thoroughbred and classic car. I don't know if anybody remembers that. <coughs> Willie was an extremely good uh, driver, uh, but he also became a good journalist, and I bet he's his, uh, his articles advocate. I suggested to Classic Bike that we start doing articles about cars, racing cars, oh, sorry, bikes, about racing bikes. And uh, the editor wrote back and said, Great news about your BSA, thanks for letting us know. Put a picture of it in the next issue. By the way, why don't you write the articles about racing bikes? Me? No, look at the bare sheet of paper. That's what it was then. And fill it with words about motorcycles. No, I couldn't do that. Well, one thing led to another, and he eventually uh, let on me hard enough to start doing it. And the very first test I ever wrote was inevitably about my own G50 matches. But it got published, and then other people started coming forward saying, well, why didn't you write about my bike? And it was, yeah, great, thank you very much, and that's how it began. However, I told you I did everything backwards, and I started out writing about vintage and classic bikes, but uh, 
I hadn't yet driven them of any but modern ones. I have a job in the travel industry as sales manager for a company that specialised travel, which took care of the drive arrangements for groups of Americans, mostly the Australians, coming to, to Britain. And by groups, I mean special groups. We, we particularly speci uh, specialised in sales and tenders. So if you're a Chevrolet car dealer and you sell 10% more cars this year than you did last year, you've got a free trip to Britain with your wife, uh, and all expenses paid, and all special things like uh, dinner, I mean, cars, things like that uh, arranged. Um, I was in Australia getting uh, organising a group for Holden cars. And I had a weekend in Sydney while I was there, and uh, I saw that the final round of the Australian Superbike Championship was taking place that weekend in Sydney at Oran Park. Oran Park was a, 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 a horse track which had a, a road race circuit with motorcycles woven in between the, uh, the, the horse sections. And the press room, when I got there, uh, was a set of wooden tables on the members' lawn looking out over the start and finish lines of the uh, of the most of the very silly. And um, I managed to get a press pass on the grounds of my working for Classic Bike, and I had a copy to show the the, uh, the, the people who, who gave out the passes. So I went into the uh, to the lawn, looked around, saw an empty place at a table, just chat there. Actually, away on one of those old Olivetti uh, portable typewriters. Do you remember know, ding, 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 and uh, the board. Pull out the bag, write it, sit back. Who are you then? Oh, I'm Alan Cathcart. I'm from England. Oh, yeah, I know you. You write about those funny old bikes, um, classic bikes. Yes. I write something funny about them. You can write. I'm a, an, an editor in Europe. Um, how do you like to work for me? Uh, who do you? Well, to know, Mike Hanlon is the owner and the editor of Australian Motorcycle News, which is the biggest magazine there. So, it is. so uh, I said, no, no, I no, mean, no, this is a hobby. It's not something that I could ever dream of doing uh, uh, full time. Well, if you change your mind, here's my card. Um, get in touch with it. Well, I went for a beer afterwards, and uh, that was that. Except. Later that year, my wife Stella and I were in the south of France. We were driving around uh, near Avignon and uh, saw BMW coming towards us. Knew it was BMW because the sills were sticking out the other side. Ooh. Oh, that's that new BMW um, off road bike, uh, uh, GS800. GS that's it. <coughs> oh, that's been the factory testers. They all seem to go everywhere two at a time because this one breaks down and the other's got me there. <laughs> it's a press launch. Quick, turn around. Couldn't it's only a little narrow road. Well, my wife said, you know, this is the MW. They're bound to do things wrong. So look at the red mission of that and see if it's a restaurant near here with a car park. Oh, so we found a, the restaurant, it was near the festival Nouveau, and we drove there around the corner, BMW, on the street Going to the, uh, to the foyer, there's the BMW hospitality. Hello, I'm Alan Kafka, I'm from, Aus from Australian Motorcycle News. Oh, this is fun, well, we have nobody here from Australia, we can save some money, we will, we will get a report in Australia without spending. Yes, that's right, uh, but only one thing wrong, we don't have a helmet. We are BMW, which size? Um, yeah, but how about some clothing? Same question. Uh, photographers? There are three. I'm in business. So I went off, I rode the bike, came back, wrote the report, sent it to Mike Hamlin, he published it, sent me a copy with a check. Hmm, real money. Oh, maybe I can make a go of this. For various reasons, uh, the travel business was getting less and less enticing. Basically, a lot of people had, had, caught, in, had caught on to the fact that what we were doing was pretty profitable, and they were trying to get our business founded by us. So, uh, the following year, 
uh, in March. Uh, I decided, March 1981, I decided that uh, I'd start writing full time about motorcycles. Gave up the job in the travel industry. Fortunately, I had a, uh, a two year contract which I was allowed to work off so that uh, I had to do 50% travel and 50% motorcycles the first year, 25 or 75, and then I was a free agent. So that helped cushion the, 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 the step of basically earning pretty good living and not earning very much at all as I built up my network of all outfits. I realized very early on that the only way to make a go out of being a motorcycle journalist was to syndicate. And the term, you may have heard it before, but it means when you're a journalist, your work is published in several different outfits around the world. At the moment, I work for magazines and uh, media outlets, websites, etc., in 31 different countries. So that's pretty good uh, coverage of the world. Um, I started building up the, the connections, and I also fortunate to speak several languages. My father was an extremely uh, gregarious person. He loved people, and was very much at home talking to complete strangers. And uh, he found it very frustrating when we were traveling in Europe. He couldn't speak the local language, so he made sure that I did learn languages when I was at school. And it's something, fortunately, that I've been able to build on down the years. So this helped when I was setting up my network. But it also became useful when I decided what I was going to write about. It basically had to be something that wasn't covered by the likes of motorcycle news and uh, other mainstream titles. And in my particular case, the, the, uh, the key to it was Italy. In those days, not many Italians spoke English. And I was fortunate to speak Italian reasonably well. And uh, I was going to be Latin at school, by the way. And I took myself off to Italy for three weeks. And I went to a total of 17 different manufacturers and race teams which built their own bikes. That seems a lot, but that was, that was Italy then. Um, small companies like RTF or Indini, the Grand Prix bikes that would finish in the, in the top six of a, of a World Championship road race. There were larger manufacturers like uh, Ducati, uh, Priya, I think they were Priya, they really started doing road bikes, so it was off road. But anyway, I went to San Venero, MBA, uh, Morbidelli, Mr. Morbidelli was a wonderful motorcycle collection that he was just then building up. Uh, but he was also going Grand Prix racing with his bikes and beating the Japanese. Um, obviously, Ducati I went to. I've been a Ducati owner ever since I was 17 years of age. So that uh, in those days, if you had an Italian bike, people thought there was something wrong with you. Because they were always breaking down, and usually for electricity. But uh, that wasn't the case with Ducati. And I had the 750 SS still, which I've been racing, production racing for a long time. So. Uh, I went to Italy and, and I wrote a separate article about all these small companies, made a point of sending them a copy of every magazine around the world which published it. And that was the, the key really, because they could then see that I was, I was delivering on what I, I, I promised. Um, so from that, I was able to build up a good network of, of uh, uh, contacts in, in Italy which then spun off into Spain and France and uh, other countries which were then involved in, in motorcycle. Um, however, then I was already, I was starting to, to do track tests for Grand Prix bikes. The very first one I ever did, or well, current Grand Prix bikes, the first one I ever did was in 1981 when I rode Anthony Ato's 125 World Champion Pirelli. I'm 5 foot 10. And on the auto, it was this tall. <laughs> so I didn't really fit very well on the bike. But the owner of, of Chiarelli was a man called Daniele Agrati. And by then I had uh, started to organize parades. So I organized the TT parade in, in 1981, which Daniele had brought his 1926 Chiarelli 350cc split single. 
Does anybody remember seeing this bike in the afternoon? Frey made the round, TT of course, including climbing the mountain on this, on this device. He was so grateful for having been able to do that, that he arranged a test for me at Monza with uh, his World Championship winning 125. And that got published. Rex White in, in uh, Suzuki, the, the manager of Suzuki's uh, race team, uh, then phoned me up and asked me if I'd like to ride a real bike. The real bike was Rob McElmay's uh, Art of Man TT winning XR75 uh, Suzuki TT1 bike. Fantastic, I rode that. That was really the breakthrough. Got published all over the world. Followed on then by the Suzuki that Rob was racing in Grand Prix, by the Grand Prix line. And that built up. This also then brought me to the attention of Honda. And Barry Simmons, a name that possibly some of you may have heard of, was the team manager of, of Honda in those days. And he let me ride Wayne Gardner's uh, Semi Works RS500 triple. At, uh, at Sedman, and I remember that uh, John Surtees came along. I got to know John at uh, classic events. He met me at races, Vincent ones. And uh, to repay him, I, I got uh, Honda to lend him Wayne's spare bike, and the two of us went around together, made a good photograph. Um, that got published in, around the world, and the next thing was I was invited to Australia to test ride Freddie Spencer's NSR 500 before that he had won the World 500cc Championship with in 1985. Why to Australia? Well, Wayne Gardner was being uh, stepped up to 500 Grand Prix racing with the factory team in 1986. And as preparation for that, he was allowed to race in the Swan Series, the end of, end of year. Uh, racing series in, uh, in Australia. Only one thing wrong, its local rival in the Honda Australia team, Mal Campbell, had to reckon that he should have had the B4, but all he, he was allowed to ride a three cylinder one, which was inferior. So uh, Mal was on a mission and he beat Wayne in the, in the first race of two that day. I, meanwhile, had arrived at the Surface Paradise Circuit directly from uh, England, just in time to watch Wayne Gardner destroy my test ride by crashing it, trying to pass uh, Mal Campbell in the second race. Hmm, I wonder if there were any spares. No. Mr. Ogama, Ogama-san, the uh, director of HRC, Honda Racing Corporation, was distraught. He was so, so upset. Alan, I know you came all the way from England to make this test tomorrow. Mr. Wayne Gardner was very wrong to crash the bike. Yet he's trying to win the race. No, my case is too bad. Alan, we apologize. Please can you come to Japan next month to test the bike? We will arrange one, one hour of Suzuka race circuit only for you. Well, um, I can't tell you how many millions of yen that cost, but it's quite a lot. So, I went to Japan, my first ever time in Japan, in January 1986. And to say super sorry, Ogum-san also arranged me to ride Freddie Spencer's NSR 250 World Champion. Remember that was the year that Freddie won both 250 and 500 World Championships? Incredible achievement. So I rode both bikes. And really that set me off on a uh, career which lasted for mm, nearly 30 years. Uh, I rode every single factory's Grand Prix bike year on year, and their Formula TT Formula 1, and then later Superbike machines. Uh, I was in the honored position of being invited to come and do it. I didn't have to, generally speaking, ask. Occasionally, just have a little reminder to Suzuki particularly. But, uh, I'm very glad to say that I mostly survived. I did crash a couple. I don't think I'd better tell you which ones. But uh, I did get that invited that year on year. Until 2009. That's the last year that I rode a MotoGP bike, or indeed any journalist rode a MotoGP bike. 
Um, the reason was that they switched to Bridgestone tyres, and Bridgestones were completely, uh, well, they were dangerous for people who were not able to ride them to the absolute limit. You had to, to ride them very, very hard indeed to keep them warm, in other words, to give them any grip. So, stopping with the GP bikes, but I still get the ensuing bikes. These were the magazine articles published all over the world. Until 2015, and I always said to myself that at the time that I got slower and I was no longer able to do a, a 600cc super sport lap time, qualifying time, on a super bike, then I should stop doing tests. Because they generally were tests, they weren't just show me, which is why I got invited back here on here. And sadly, in 2015, that time came. I could do bits of a good lap, but I couldn't put it all together into a good time. So I stopped, and uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry not to be able to ride, for example, uh, um, top Frank Razgatlio, who's uh, world superbike for Yamaha, but on the other hand, uh, you have to accept the fact that Tempest screwed it. Now all along, I kept on riding modern street bikes, and uh, it's interesting that today I'm often asked for a test of a bike that I did back in the 1980s or 1990s, the road bike, that has now become, of course, a classic. So I'm fortunate that I have a very good archive of photos and, uh, and the text of the story. But my, my earliest and still uh, longest lasting passion for motorcycles is vintage bikes kind that we all love here. Uh, those of you who, who have read the uh, excellent monthly magazine produced by my friend Peter Enshaw will know that uh, occasionally uh, I'm uh, just finding space for articles of mine in the magazine. Several of these come from the Sammy Miller Museum and I'm very fortunate to be able to have the keys to anything I want to in that museum. 95% of the bikes there are in running condition. So thanks to Sammy, but also to the owners of other bikes, individuals, I'm able to keep on riding and writing about bikes which I find really, really interesting. Interesting because often of the company history, the people behind them, the, the, the reason why these bikes were ever built in the first place. Interesting because of their technical makeup. And sometimes a combination of both. People are often surprised when they, they ask me, what's, oh, what's your favourite uh, road bike? My favourite road bike is the 1929 Ascot Pullin Sport Utility 500. What? Oh, let's see how many of you know what that is. Who knows, hands up, who knows what an Ascot Pullin is? Alright, about 10%, if that. Cyril Pullin was the winner of the 1914 Oil of Man Senior TT. Uh, after the Great War, he became a test rider for Douglas, but he also started a business to try and uh, manufacture motorcycles to meet the demand for personal transportation after the, the Great War. Um, he had one go at it, didn't work. Uh, then he had a second go at it in 1928 with this incredible device monocoque frame, uh, hydraulic, self adjusting hydraulic brakes, uh, linked in a later example. He had, uh, uh, like the John Clare Norton that won the Isle of Man TT in 1973, he had a separate fuel tank and oil tank within the modern car. It was an incredible device. Sammy Miller has the only, I think, running one at the moment. So I've been able to run that and ride it back. I've also, also, also often asked, how what's your favorite race car? I have to say it's a dead heat. Actually, no, probably a three-way dead heat. Modern bikes, Valentino Rossi's 19, sorry, 2003 RC211P Honda, the five-cylinder Honda that they had had one year of development on, and then in, 19, in 2003 they made this incredible device, which was, as far as I can turn, the greatest racing motorcycle of the modern era. Of Olden five days, dead heat between Mike Elwood's six cylinder uh, 250 Honda, which I was able to ride in Canada, and 
the Mudrigut Sea P8, which is on display in the Sangamon Museum. And I've been fortunate enough to ride four times at different events. Um, the reason probably you can understand is the technical complexity of the bikes, but also the sound and the feel that they make. That they make it's just so stirring to ride to ride with machines like that. Uh, I'm often asked, Alan, why are you still doing this? Isn't it time to retire? Well, actually, I enjoy going to work. I'm one of those very fortunate people who managed to make his, his, his hobby his livelihood. And I'm understanding why he absolutely does not want me to retire. He does not be hanging around the house, getting in the way. So I plan to keep on riding and riding for as long as I can. And I hope those of you who read my articles will continue to buy the magazines or go to the website to do so. Thank you. So, uh, I knew Eddie Lawson pretty well, 
at the Bologna Motorcycle Show in uh, yeah, Motor Show cars as well in December. They had a supermoto race for bikes, and Eddie was there, and he was sitting at the at the at the back of his of his transit van. And as I walked towards him, he started smiling. I said, "Hi, Eddie, how are you doing?" Actually, he rode my bike. I said, "Yep." He said, "How did it do?" He said, "He tried to kill me." John. <laughs> So this is a long answer to a short question. Uh, the next year, for the first time, I, I had uh, I got invited to, to lunch at Ikebukuro Station in Tokyo before I took the train to go to Nagoya and Suzuka Circuit. And Okuma-san wanted to take me to lunch at a restaurant. The uh, Japanese love coming through. So we sit down and we have a chat and up this and that, and then coffee arrives. And what was that? What was that? Said to me, Alan San, this year arranging your test was a little bit difficult. Oh, why? What, 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 what's wrong? Mm, your report last year about Eddie Dawson 500, uh, this caused some problems with our engineers. I said, well, I'm sorry, but what I wrote is the truth. And I remember very well in doing this, he said, I know it was truth. And I tell them, Alan Kaka always writes truth. So you must accept truth. So here is your ticket for Nagoya. Please go and catch the train. Anybody else? <laughs> no, I'm waiting for Harry to come and tell me to stop. Yes, yes, sir. Good question. Um, I, I've met, I've been to lots of small companies. Uh, other, other uh, small companies, are there any of those that have inspired me or that I've really appreciated for their design? Yeah. Right. One of them is three miles from here, or was three miles from here, Norton in Chester. Rotary motorcycles are not everybody's cup of tea, but they are still motorcycles. And if you ride a rotary motorcycle, you can't help but be impressed by the liquid smooth torque that you get from this, this engine. No vibration. Sounds a bit like a two-stroke, but it's not a two-stroke. You do get engine braking. So Brian Crichton, working at Norton uh, Shenstone, um, in the case before it became what it is today, uh, I went to the new Norton factory in Solly Hull uh, last week. Believe me, TBS India, the new Indian owners, have spent a packet on this. There is no chance they're going to take uh, Norton production to India or they're going to sell it off to a venture capitalist. They've invested much too much money to be able to make a profit doing that. So they're here for the long time and uh, Norton is in very good hands. That was not the case when it was a chance, but it had Brian Crichton, who was the engineer that actually was working on the, uh, the rotary engines for the Israeli army's drones. And he thought, this could make a good motorcycle engine. They already were making the classic. Uh, this was the, the liquid cool one, and it had real potential. And look what happened. They won the British, uh, was it TT401? I think it was, fourth game superbike championship twice. Uh, Became competitive in 500 Grand Prix, although I never could work out how a 588cc bike was allowed to compete in 500 Grand Prix. Um, and yeah, I thought that was a fantastic device. In fact, next year is the, is the 30th anniversary of Steve Islop winning the Senior TT on the road trip after that incredible battle with Carl Fogarty's young man. If anybody went to the TT that year, well, that was so exciting. And Britain won. So that would be my best example. Marion, I'd like to keep asking, asking questions or not? Absolutely. You can okay, one more. Yes, sir. Well, let's have a meeting. Yes. Um, are, there, are there any young journalists or are there any, are there any motorcycle, young motorcycle journalists at all that I admire? Um, well, my biggest hero is Matt Oxley because uh, Matt 
has done the same sort of thing as I've done, except that he tends to focus more on modern uh, Grand Prix uh, journalists, but he still writes about the, the, the old ones. And if you haven't read his book, Stealing Speed, about Ernst Degner's def defection from NZ to Suzuki, I urge you to do it. Uh, but as far as younger journalists are concerned, I think it would be very hard for somebody to do what I've done uh, today. And there are a number of reasons for that. One is that so much of it is, is digitalized. And if you, if you allow your article to be in English to be published on the web, immediately it loses its value because by definition, the, anybody in India or, or Australia or the USA can access it on, on the web. Um, that's why I try very hard to make sure my articles are not published in English um, on the web. Czech, no problem. Uh, Malaysian, no problem. But English is the lingua franca of motorcycle journeys, which is the reason why I was able to do what, what, what I did. If I'd been writing in Italian or even French or German, I wouldn't be able to do it because there simply isn't the, the means of trans. First of all, there are not that many magazines publishing those articles in, in those languages in the old days when the article was on the printed page. But the same thing is true in, in modern day. Uh, um, website media. Um, not enough people would be able to translate the Italian or the English or the German or the French very easily. So, sorry, <laughs> but <laughs> no. Yeah. Anybody else? No one? There's something Yes, sir. Have you ever written one of Cole Pellington's Grand Yes, I have. I've ever written, have I ever written one of Cole Pellington's Grand Prix winning bikes? I wrote two. Uh, the KR350 Tandem Twin, uh, which was a lovely bike. Very, uh, 250s and 350s were the ultimate motorcycles. And I was so, so upset when the FIM killed them off in a move which I still regard as completely motivated by money. Uh, this was in 2009 when the 250 class was killed off in favor of, of one make engine racing at World Championship level with a Honda. But with a Honda 600 engine that wasn't even as fast as, as, as a super sport. Um, so the Tandem Twin was a great one, and uh, I'm not surprised that other riders had so much success with it. However, the KR500 uh, square four rotary valve monocoque framed bike was deeply flawed. The problem was the wheelbase, for some reason, they made it four inches longer than. than it ever should have been. And you talk to Cork, and unfortunately, he had the same problem. You couldn't convince the Japanese to make a small, compact, easy steering motorcycle. So, pity, missed chance because great design, monocoque chassis, lovely, beautifully made. Um, Kawasaki is an interesting company because the only reason they got into motorcycles was that before the Second World War, they were. Um, Japan's largest aircraft manufacturer. But after the war, they weren't allowed to make aircraft anymore. So, same as in Italy, there was a need for post war personal transportation. Well, the railway lines were knocked out by bombing and stuff, so people needed motorcycles to get around. And Kawasaki started making engines only in their, um, in their Asaki uh, factory, aircraft factory. And they sold it to lots of other small manufacturers who were making their own. Then they decided, hmm, why don't we make our own? And so they did. They bought a company called Meguro, which Meguro was the largest um, Japanese motorcycle manufacturer. And for various reasons, they had fallen on hard times. So they purchased Meguro. Mm -hmm. And in those days, Meguro made copies of PSA um, parallel twins, 500s and 650s. Uh, Kawasaki perpetuated that by making the W1, which was a copy of a, a PSA Lightning, and uh, but made a little bit better and made a little bit finer, better tolerances. And sorry, in the end, it was a better bike. Uh, but then while they were doing that, they were developing their own um, range of, of three cylinder two strokes. And of course, and if anybody here has one, but that changed the world in terms of, of performance for the average customer. 
but they still kept on building the W3 it was by then alongside the three cylinder triples and then eventually it uh, popped over. One more question? Anybody else? Yes sir. Good question. Did I ever ride Raymond Roche's Ducati 888, 1990 world champion? No. <laughs> I bet. I had already begun riding with him. I'd already begun racing Ducatis, and uh, I was in fact the first person outside the factory to be supplied with a Ducati 851 kit to race in the New Zealand Superbike Championship, which was the, 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 the power winter, their uh, summer, of the, um, the launch of the bike, 1987-88. And unfortunately, the bike got held up in a customs strike in, in Milan, so I never actually got to race it then. And my consolation was that I was allowed to test Marco Lucanelli's prototype, the AP851 Delore, that demolished me and everybody else on a two valve Panther engine bike at Daytona in the Battle of the Twins. And then I rode Marco's uh, uh, superbike. The, the, the red one, the 888, that uh, he won the very first um, World Superbike race with the France at Donny Park. However, due to internal struggles within the PR department, Ducati factory, I never got to wear a ride race and brought his bike when they won the championship two years later. But it was made up to me the following year when I rode Doug Poland's world champion. But I still would like to bring the race. <laughs> I think that's going to be it. So thanks very much indeed to all of you for coming.